Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Homeschooling, Protecting Freedom, Protecting Children. Um, uh, as you probably know, we are about to discuss what's become a pretty hot topic. Uh, in part, it's hot because just about probably every student in the world has been schooling at home a great deal over the last few months as we've been coping with COVID-19. Um, but we're also uh, discussing a hot topic because homeschooling itself has grown a great deal over the last several years uh, and has uh, gathered a lot more attention, both from people who really like it and people who have concerns about some of the potential downsides of homeschooling. Um, so because this is such a hot topic, our event today is going to be as efficient and succinct as possible because we have lots of interest, lots of questions, lots of comments, and we want to get to all of them. So the way things are going to work, we're going to start with very quick intros of our panelists. Each panelist is going to get seven minutes uh, to provide pre uh, prepared remarks. And then we're going to go right on to our questions and answers. Now, there are many ways you can submit questions and comments. Uh, there are multiple platforms that people are watching this on. Some people are on YouTube. Some are on uh, the Cato Institute's uh, website. There are some following along on Twitter. If you want to submit a question on Twitter, please use hashtag Cato, C-A-T-O, C-E-F. That's hashtag Cato, C-E-F. And all of your questions and comments uh, will eventually reach me, um, and I will be uh, both a panelist and moderator. Um, and so I'm now going to introduce the panelists and the orders with which they will speak. And then we're going to get right into remarks. And so you're probably asking yourself, or maybe you are, well, who is this guy? I am the Neil McCluskey, and I am the director of Cato's Center for Educational Freedom. And as I said, I will be both moderator and the first panelist. So I get to control what everyone else is saying and say whatever I want. Um, next, we have Milton Gaither, who's a professor of education at Messiah College and author of Homeschool uh, in American History. And I have his book here, just a, a very quick story, because I said we'd be efficient. This is not uh, because I was trying to curry favor with them or something like that. It just happened to be the book I chose uh, to put in my briefcase the last day that we were able to be in the office at Cato because uh, I wanted to read it. So I just happened to have it with me. Uh, don't worry, other panelists have great things to read and I just don't have them with me because they didn't, they weren't lucky enough to make it in my briefcase the last day we were in the office. Our next uh, panelist is Carrie McDonald, who is an adjunct scholar at Cato. Uh, and she's the author of the book, Unschooled, Raising Curious, Well-Educated Children Outside of the Conventional Classroom. I certainly have a copy of her book, but like I said, it is locked away where I cannot access, but it's available at fine booksellers everywhere. And then finally, we have Elizabeth Bartlett. She's the Morris Wasserstein Public Interest Professor of Law and the Faculty Director of the Child Advocacy Program at Harvard University. She's also the author of an Arizona Law Review article that really kind of uh, ignited a debate about the proper parameters for homeschooling, also then became part of an article in Harvard Magazine. Um, and that law review article is Homeschooling, Parent Rights Absolutism versus Child Rights to Education and Protection. So I thank all the panelists for joining me today. Our goal is to have more of a discussion than a debate. We're not going to be lobbing zingers at each other or anything like that. Uh, and we're hoping to eventually maybe by the time we're done, at least direct people to where there may be some common ground in dealing with concerns that I think are legitimate that come from all sides of the homeschooling issue. And so with that, I now transition from moderator to panelist. Uh, what I'm going to do in my remarks is try and frame today's discussion along libertarian lines and, why, uh, and explain how the libertarian answer for how homeschooling uh, may or may not be regulated may not be as simple as some people might think a libertarian uh, may approach the issue. So first, just a very basic uh, understanding of libertarianism. Basically, uh, the idea is that people who are capable of self-government, of taking care of themselves, should be able to make decisions for themselves and voluntarily enter into interactions with other people without government getting involved. As long, that is, as neither force nor fraud are involved. So if I want to start a company and I 
get a voluntary partner and I say, I get 90% of the profits and they get 10% of the profits and they agree to that, there's no role for government to be involved. However, if I were holding a gun to the head of my uh, partner or I lied about what product we'd be producing, then there could be a role for the state to intervene. Education and children's issues become much more difficult because the assumption is that children are not capable of self-government. Now there are debates about at what age does a child become capable of making informed decisions for themselves, but I think most people would agree at the very least, an infant or a toddler or a preschooler is probably not able to make uh, dis educational decisions fully for themselves. And so then the question is who should be making those decisions? Is it the parents or the state? There are certainly other people who could make those decisions, but that's generally what the debate has come down to. The first thing I'd say is it's often phrased as parents have a right to make decisions for their children. And I have concerns about the idea that you have a right to make decisions for your kids. I think that we nobody has a sort of uh, inherent right to control the lives of the life of someone else. So I get concerned when we frame this as parents' rights. Um, however, I believe that parents incur a duty to care for their children when they have kids. And that care should be aimed at enabling those kids to become self-governing when they are adults. They need to equip them to do that. Uh, what that means is providing food, housing, clothing, and yes, some level of education to equip those kids to be self-governing adults. Well, what's the role of the state? The first thing that's crucially done, crucial to understand is the role of the state needs to be very heavily constrained. We have government in order to secure the rights to life, liberty, and happiness. Government exists to protect freedom, to protect us from force or fraud by others, and to maximize the sphere of voluntary association and free action. In education, that means that the default proper role of the state is to intervene only when kids have been harmed or have had harm inflicted on them. Well, what does that mean for the homeschooling discussion? It really kind of in, uh, manifests itself in two major areas. The first is physical abuse or neglect of children. And the state, I think most people would agree, absolutely has a role to stop physical abuse or neglect of children. Um, and I think that concerns about abuse or neglect that occur under the guise of homeschooling are very legitimate concerns to have that we need to deal with. That said, the normal process by which we deal with these sorts of problems is first there is suspicion of abuse or neglect, then there's an investigation to find evidence of, of uh, abuse or neglect, and that is if there's enough evidence collected followed by a trial in which there is innocence until guilt is proven, an assumption of innocence for the parents or guardians of those children. The norm is not to have the state require that people demonstrate that they're committing crimes. This is why homeschoolers are reasonable when they suspect or are concerned about inspection regimes and other intrusions like that. But because children are uniquely vulnerable, it may be reasonable to have occasional, maybe once annually, unannounced drop-ins on homeschooling families. Also, no one should be allowed to homeschool, I think, if they have been convicted of abuse or neglect. But what about educational neglect? This is much less clear than physical abuse. There is a unique danger of government uh, involved in deciding what kids will learn. We give government a monopoly, a legal monopoly on force, making it a unique threat to impose orthodoxy on everyone. The, I, the ability and government actually imposing some sort of orthodoxy on all people is totally antithetical to a free and pluralist society. If we believe that a child, however, must have an education to be self-governing uh, as a self-governing adult, but we want to prevent government-imposed orthodoxy, what is it that we should do? What is the role of government? Again, government should only intervene if a child is not getting what I think are the basic building blocks to learn. That's the ability to read, to do math, and to write. Those are the stepping stones that enable them to access all other subjects. We need government to steer clear of everything else because almost all other subjects quickly involve worldviews, and it is extremely dangerous to have government decide one worldview is okay and another or many others are not acceptable. 
And so if you think about it, science, if we talk about science quickly, we have evolution, climate change. These are things that reasonable people can disagree about. Literature, how do you teach the Bible? Is it literature or is it the inspired word of God? How about Huckleberry Finn? Is that too offensive? Is the bluest eye offensive? When you talk about history, now you're talking about politics, a very dangerous thing to have the government decide X is the body that everybody should learn. Y are things that are off limits. That said, again, perhaps there is some compromise. Well, I should back up. Again, how do we deal with parents who may not be supplying these basic skills? Uh, we again follow the standard sort of judicial procedure. If there's suspicion that somebody is not providing basic education to their children, there's an investigation. If the investigation turns up sufficient evidence that parents are not providing a basic education to their children, then there's a trial and there's a, uh, an assumption of innocence on part of the parent or guardians. But there could be perhaps some compromise, again, because children are not equipped to advocate for themselves. Um, there may be a reasonable requirement that there be some annual test to people who are in school just to ensure that these basic uh, skills are being taught. Ultimately, we should give a wide berth to homeschooling, first and foremost, because government control of minds and ideas is uniquely dangerous and antithetical to a free society. But it is not as simple a situation to say, just allow children or families to do as they please because children are not capable of self-governance and advocating and protecting themselves. So there is, I think, clearly a role of government to stop abuse or neglect. And there may be a role to proactively, but minimally monitor the provision of education to homeschool children. Now, Milton, the floor is yours. Well, if you're looking for a convenient signpost to mark the beginning of the homeschooling movement in the U.S., you might choose the publication of the first ever newsletter devoted to the practice. Hand typed and sent out to a few families by the famous education reformer John Holt in August of 1977. One of the major concerns of that issue and of those that followed was state regulations. At that time, state statutes about homeschooling varied widely. Fourteen state compulsory schooling laws said nothing at all about it though they did usually mention the acceptability of children being taught in private schools. 15 explicitly mentioned home instruction in one way or another. The remaining 21 contained phrases like equivalent instruction elsewhere or instruction by a private tutor that could be read to imply recognition of home education as a legitimate option. The 36 states with either explicit or implied provisions differed over what rules applied to this alternate pathway and over who was in charge of regulating. Some were very vague, offering no real guidance. Some established robust requirements for home education. Six even required that any home educator had to be certified by the state, just like a public school teacher. In states whose statutes didn't mention homeschooling but did recognize private schools, homeschoolers in the late 1970s and 1980s argued in courts that homeschooling was a form of private schooling. They frequently won. And in many states today, homeschooling is treated like private schooling and regulated as such, which is to say it's not really regulated beyond being required registration with the state as a private school, like happens in Missouri and Kentucky. In some states with private school equivalency, like Illinois, Indiana, and Texas, you don't even have to register. In the 30 states, 36 states with actual or implied statutory language about homeschooling, most in the 1970s left regulation up to local officials. Now, in the late 1970s, most local education officials were tolerant of homeschooling, largely because the rare homeschooler in those years typically approached the school as a mild-mannered pedagogical progressive who wanted to experiment with a more liberatory pedagogy. But by the mid-1980s, a much larger group of homeschoolers existed, most of whom were antagonistic Christian fundamentalists, convinced the public education was indoctrination into godless secular Across the country, local school officials became hostile and legal battles multiplied. Some state courts upheld the restrictive regulations, but others concluded that the state statutes were unconstitutionally vague. In both cases, the battle for homeschooling regulation would move from the courts to the state legislatures. 37 states added or updated home education language in their compulsory school laws in the years between 1981, most of them in response to pressure from well-organized and vocal homeschooling advocates energized by court cases that either upheld the current law that these homeschoolers found oppressive or that ruled that the current law was unconstitutionally vague. 
It was here in the legislatures that the true power of grassroots homeschooling activism proved itself again and again, as homeschoolers presented shows of force, the likes of which state legislatures had never seen before, keeping the pressure on until they got what they wanted. By the mid-1990s, homeschooling was clearly legal and easy to do in every state of the country. But the story does not end there. Most of the laws states passed in the 1980s and 1990s did include regulations of one sort or another, ranging from the simple requirement that homeschoolers report the number of children they are removing from school, to requirements that homeschooling parents have at least a high school diploma or a GED, to specific curricular requirements and some form of oversight by the school district, to record keeping requirements regarding time spent schooling, to regular assessments of student progress. Legal challenges to these regulations initiated by homeschoolers have consistently failed. But year by year, homeschoolers and their allies in state legislatures have steadily rolled them back. Since 1995, 17 states have removed accountability mechanisms their original law had included, while to date, 32 attempts to add or restore accountability mechanisms have failed. Only two times have bills aimed to increase accountability been successful. The first was in 2008 in Washington, D.C., in the wake of the horrific case of the murder of her four daughters by homeschooling mother Benita Jacks in 2007. The bodies of the girls were found rotting in bedrooms on the second floor of Jacks' house months after the girls were killed. The case was so shocking that it gave lawmakers the mettle to resist the massive onslaught of opposition to their proposed regulations mounted by the Homeschool Legal Defense Association and other activists. DC homeschoolers must now provide annual notification, have a high school diploma or equivalent, maintain a regular portfolio of activities subject to review by the Office of the State Superintendent up to twice a year, and are subject to gradually more stringent penalties should they fail to comply with these requirements. More recently, Georgia in 2019 passed House Bill 530, which tries to increase the level of communication between local school districts and the Department of Human Services in cases where parents remove their children from public schools without filing a declaration of intent to do so. Overall, however, homeschooling is now mostly or completely unregulated in most of the country. In 11 states, you don't even have to tell anyone you're doing it. This has made it possible for criminals to hide child abuse and neglect, horrific torture that can last for years, and murder. We have no statistics on the frequency with which this happens. All we have are anecdotes. And of these, there are hundreds, with more appearing regularly in news accounts across the country. To cite just one recent example, on May 25th of this year, Michael and Shirley Gray were arrested after a passerby alerted law enforcement authorities to an emaciated 10-year-old boy walking alone on a road in Tennessee. The boy began to tell police what was happening in the family home. And on investigation, the police found an older son, age 15, who had been locked in the basement without sanitation or outside contact for four years, fed only bread and water. They found a daughter's remains, which had been buried under a barn in 2017. And when they searched a previous property the Grays had lived in, they found the remains of another daughter, buried in 2015. All four children were registered as homeschoolers in Tennessee. This is just one of hundreds of stories, a database of which you can find on the website, Homeschooling's Invisible Children. Reading through them is very sobering and should cause all Americans of goodwill to come together to construct policies that will seek to maximize freedom for actual homeschoolers while protecting children from predators using the isolation unregulated homeschooling enables to hide their crimes. Carrie, over to you. Thank you, Neil, and <clears throat> thank you to the Cato Institute for hosting this important event. I am honored to be on today's panel and look forward to a dynamic discussion. Since Professor Elizabeth Bartholet's Arizona Law Review article this spring prompted a corresponding feature in the May-June issue of Harvard Magazine emphasizing the risks of homeschooling, Parents who have chosen this education option, as well as others who champion education choice, are understandably upset and angry. 
I am a homeschooling parent right here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, just a couple of blocks away from Harvard's main campus, who has spent much of my life and career advocating to protect the right of families to live free from government intervention. And I am both surprised and concerned at the deeply illiberal values that undergird arguments to limit homeschooling freedoms. Professor Bartholet proposes a presumptive ban on homeschooling that would allow homeschooling only after parents first prove that they are worthy of the task, and after they also agree to other government involvement, such as regular home visits by government-mandated reporters of child abuse, frequent standardized testing, and requiring that their children still take at least some classes at their local government school certainly sounds like a homeschooling ban to me. At the heart of this challenge is a fundamental question. Should government intervene in family life and monitor the myriad choices each family makes when there is no evidence of wrongdoing? In other words, is the role of government to suggest that families are guilty until proven innocent and must be kept under close watch in order to protect children? We should all be concerned about protecting children. The question is, who is presumed to be better suited to this task, parents or the state? Professor Bartholet is concerned about protecting children in three ways, ideologically, academically, and physically. Beginning with the ideological, and while relying on astonishingly false stereotypes of today's homeschoolers, she writes in her law review piece, quote, a very large proportion of homeschooling parents are ideologically committed to isolating their children from the majority culture and indoctrinating them in views and values that are in serious conflict with that culture. She goes on to write, the nature of the homeschooling population presents dangers for children and society, end quote. This rhetoric is nothing new a deep distrust of parents, and in particular, parents who may be skeptical of prevailing cultural ideology, is a stain on the history of American education that continues today. The 19th century roots of US compulsory schooling reveal disdain toward many families, especially Irish Catholic immigrant parents who challenged the dominant Anglo-Saxon Protestant culture of the time. Calling for a compulsory schooling law, William Swan, editor of the Massachusetts Teacher, wrote in 1851, quote, our chief difficulty is with the Irish. He goes on to say, in too many instances, the parents are unfit guardians of their own children. Nothing can operate effectually here but stringent legislation thoroughly carried out by an efficient police. The children must be gathered up and forced into school and those who resist or impede this plan, whether parents or priests, must be held accountable and punished." End quote. One year later, Massachusetts passed the nation's first compulsory school attendance law, which for the first time mandated that parents send their children to school under a legal threat of force. Many Catholic parents rebelled and established their own parallel system of parochial schools, which the government continuously tried to attack and weaken, this effort peaked in 1922 when Oregon banned private schools, a law that was overturned by the US Supreme Court stating that the child is not the mere creature of the state. Today, homeschooling parents fight a similar ongoing battle to raise and educate their children as they choose free from government intervention. Critics of homeschooling, as well as those who seek heightened regulation, argue that the government should ensure a particular educational standard through ongoing oversight and evaluation. It may seem convenient to impose government control on families who opt out of conventional schooling, but it limits freedom, originality, experimentation, and divergence. We may not like how different families choose to live and learn, but that is no excuse to intolerantly impose our own preferences on them through government force. And let's be very clear, this is government force that is being called for here. In addition to being concerned with ideological indoctrination of homeschooled children by their parents, while seemingly ignoring the widespread indoctrination of children in government schools, Professor Bartholet is also concerned about homeschooling parents' abilities to effectively guide their children's education academically. While more inquiry is welcomed, most of the research on homeschooling families conducted over the past several decades 
including a recent literature review by Dr. Lindsay Burke of the Heritage Foundation, finds positive academic outcomes of homeschooling children. Additionally, 2019 research by Professor Daniel Hamlin at the University of Oklahoma found that compared to children in government schools, homeschool children are two to three times more likely to go to a library, museum, art gallery, historic site, or cultural event, and one and a half times more likely to visit a zoo, aquarium, or bookstore during the course of a month. If we contrast these findings with the academic results of children in government schools, we should really be asking ourselves, why are we even having this debate? According to the most recent NAEP scores, math and reading scores declined, and two-thirds of U.S. students are not reading proficiently. Additionally, only 15% of students are proficient in U.S. history. If the government can't even ensure an adequate academic environment for the children enrolled in its own schools, how can it possibly argue for the right to control those who opt out? In her law review article, Professor Bartholet also explains that she advocates for a presumptive ban on homeschooling to protect children from physical abuse or neglect that could be hidden if children don't attend school. As with the academic argument, there is no compelling evidence that homeschooling parents are more likely to abuse their children than non-homeschooling parents. And some research just suggests that homeschooling parents are actually less likely to abuse their children. Additionally, and perhaps most disturbingly, this argument ignores the fact that children are routinely abused in government schools by government educators. Headlines abound of educators abusing children on school premises. And a 2004 U.S. Department of Education study found that one in 10 children who attend a government school will be sexually maltreated by a government school employee by the time the child graduates from high school. That is 5 million kids. And that is only abuse of children by educators. Peer abuse in the form of peer sexual assault and bullying is rampant in schools with data suggesting that nearly half of all school children in grades 4 to 12 are bullied at least once a month. Professor Bartholet concludes her law review article by saying that, quote, to the degree public schools are seriously deficient, our society should work on improving them rather than simply allowing some parents to escape, end quote. The government should work to improve its own schools where academic deficiencies and abuse are pervasive, but it should have no role in deciding whether or not parents are allowed to escape. Instead of presumptive bans, we should be celebrating the freedom and flexibility of homeschooling and using it as a model for government schools to follow. Thank you. Elizabeth? Thank you, Neil and Cato. Um, I approach the homeschooling issues from the perspective that children should be seen as having rights and rights that are of equal value to adult rights. And uh, in connection with that, I think, and related some to how uh, some of the things Neil said, um, children don't have the power that adults do to protect themselves. So I think it's important that um, the government be there as a uh, protector for children and uh, be able to intervene to help protect some of their most fundamental rights. So in terms of the fundamental rights I'm concerned with in the homeschooling area, um, it's both protection against abuse and neglect and also uh, rights to education. Neil talked about this libertarian view and the right to sort of be free from government intervention. Again, I think when you're talking about children, you need to think about their right to positive intervention from the government to protect them. And one interesting comparison is to look at most of our peer countries, and indeed most countries in the world. Most countries in the world have um, built into their constitutions very positive, very powerful positive protections for child rights. Indeed, the most popular provisions that have been written into constitutions in recent decades are protections for education and protections against abuse and neglect for children. Related to that, uh, most of our peer countries take a very different approach to homeschooling and um, uh, provide much more significant regulation to ensure that children are indeed educated. So I want to focus on my two major concerns with 
the current unregulated state of homeschooling. And my my concern with homeschooling is not homeschooling per se, it's unregulated homeschooling. It's the fact that there is virtually no meaningful regulation or oversight to ensure either protection against abuse and neglect or that children uh, are given the fundamentals of an education. So that again, to go back to sort of just clarifying my position, I've never said that I was for a total ban and I don't think that the quote presumptive ban that I do propose um, actually resembles anything like what Kerry described. Um, so I'll just say briefly my concerns about um, both child protection and education and the kind of regulation that I think would be appropriate. As a general matter, first, I just want to emphasize that I think masses of homeschooling of parents are no doubt doing a great job educating. And I have no fear that a significant number of homeschooling parents are abusing and neglecting their children. My concern is with a subset of the children who are being homeschooled. Now, Mostly in our society, we regulate um, with respect to protecting subsets. So when you think of our regulation with respect to child abuse and neglect generally, we have regulation, we have child protective service agencies, we have mandated reporters, not because we think most parents or a majority of parents or even a huge significant number of parents abuse and neglect their children. It's because a subset do and we need these kinds of laws and protections to protect that subset. So if we look again at homeschooling and the area of abuse and neglect, yes, I think we have reason to worry that there is a very strong connection between homeschooling and child abuse and neglect. Um, I think there are a couple of studies, and I won't go into them now, but be happy to discuss them in the Q&A, a couple of studies that show um, a uh, worrisome connection. We don't have the kind of research we would like to have in this area, again, in large part because we don't have regulation because kids aren't required to register very often, and it's hard to study this population, but there are some scary research studies out there. Um, more generally, homeschoolers very often, and again, it's not always, but many homeschooling parents raise their children in very significant isolation. This is a fact. It is also true many homeschoolers engage their children with the outside world to a significant degree, but many do not. So isolation, the kind of isolation that characterizes lots of homeschooling parents um, is a risk. If you look at the research on abuse and neglect generally, it uh, happens disproportionately, overwhelmingly disproportionately in isolated families. Um, so what protects children? What did we build in as a major step when we created a child protection system in this country? We built in mandated reporters, a system of teachers and other people who come into regular contact with most children are required by law to report suspected abuse to child protective services agencies. That's how those agencies have a chance to investigate and decide if children need more, more aggressive intervention to protect them. Teachers are the largest group of mandated reporters. Most children in this society, all the children who go to public schools have that minimum bit and very important bit of protection that they see teachers on a daily basis or are supposed to, and teachers, if they suspect abuse and neglect, have to report it so that it can be investigated. So in that area, I think we need minimum regulation to protect children um, in the homeschooling area. This is not massive surveillance of homeschooling parents, but I think before you're allowed to homeschool, there should be a check with Child Protective Services to see if the family has a significant record of abuse and neglect. And if they do have that record, I do not think the parents should be allowed to homeschool so that they can keep their children in the kind of isolation that means ongoing abuse and neglect won't be registered or reported. So the check with CPS. Um, I also think it's important that there be 
contact beyond that, that homeschooling families ought to have their children see people other than the parents. So it's for that reason, or part that's part of the reason that I propose that all homeschooling families, um, the children should be required to take a course, to take extra activities to go to the public school where they will see mandated dated reporters um, and have people have other eyes on that child and the opportunity for report. A once a year visit of the kind Neil said he might be open to is not going to be enough to protect children. Um, but it, you know, we know that even when they're in schools and reported, it's often hard to get the attention of CPS. Um, but in any event, it's obviously incredibly easy for parents to hide abuse and neglect if they only have to be seen once um, once a year. In the realm of education, um, I also think there has to be minimum regulation to protect the child's basic right to learn, to have the kind of learning that will enable that child, when child grows up, to have opportunities for employment um, and other opportunities in life to be part of society if they should choose to do that. So I think there has to be um, some check on whether the parents actually are capable of teaching. We now have almost no regulation in that respect. Only a dozen states have any uh, requirement that parents have any credentials whatsoever in order to teach. Um, and those states only require a, house, a high school degree. Secondly, I think there needs to be an, a meaningful assessment by the state, not just by parents testing their own children, but state tests to assess whether on an annual basis children are actually learning math, science, reading, writing skills that are going to be essential if they want to access a whole lot of employment and other opportunities. And finally, and this is my final point, time's up, um, I think that education needs to include some exposure to views and values other than those of the parents. This is completely different from uh, imposing orthodoxy, uh, which Neil um, registered concern with. Of course, I don't want to impose orthodoxy on children. Even if children are at school in, on a regular schedule, the parents have, you know, more hours of control over the child's thinking than the school does by far. Um, I just think that it's great that parents want to raise kids in their own views and values with their own religion. I'm not trying to interfere with that. I'm saying that children have a right to exposure to some other people and ideas about how, how one might live one's life so that when they become adults, they have some meaningful opportunity to choose something other than the views, the values, the culture that their own parents have chosen. Well, oh, thank you very much to all the panelists. Um, we have right now about 120 questions or comments. I'm sorry, we're not going to be able to get to all of them. I've been as uh, assiduously as I can getting through them, trying to put them together. A lot of people are asking very similar things. So my first question uh, that will be prefaced with a little of my own thoughts on it, but brings together a bunch of questions that people ask. I'm afraid I can't mention everybody by name, but there are a few people who have asked things that um, feed into this. But I think kind of the, the question that is, uh, hovering over all of this is, do we have reason to believe that having kids in public schools or having public school influence has a better, you know, a greater net gain than if people were free to educate as they want, including with homeschooling? So we have questions about, you know, do people really, or do students, are they built into better citizens if they go to public schools and if they are homeschooled? And there's certainly some evidence that suggests public schools are not doing a particularly good job as a system of producing uh, good citizens. The latest NAEP civic scores are very low. I think it was about a quarter or so only of students who are proficient. Uh, in Detroit, you may have seen the uh, uh, court case that, that ultimately ruled that students were unconstitutionally denied rights to education in their public schools because they weren't given access to basic literacy. Uh, we have um, Paul from uh, Kansas City. I'm not sure what platform he came to us from, but he says uh, he was a teacher in the Kansas City School District. He said it was very violent. 
and the students did poorly, but not for lack of money, uh, says we homeschool, why should we have to justify not sending our kids to a failed dangerous place for seven hours a day? That lends itself to the question of, do we have reason to believe public schools are safer places than, um, home, than the home? or than private schools. Jane said that for five years, actually, she was uh, sexually abused in a public school and nobody caught it. So all of this goes into the question of what is the evidence that we are kids are safer in public schooling or when there is some government oversight of homeschooling versus when people are left alone and families are left alone to educate as they see fit. Now, to answer these questions, I'm going to try and sort of mix up the order in which I call on people. Uh, I'm calling on people because otherwise we could all step on each other. So uh, I'm not trying to play favorites or uh, anything like that. I may not continue to get the reorganization exactly right every time, but we'll start with Elizabeth on this and then I will call Carrie next and then Milton. So Elizabeth, if you want to start. Public schools have lots of problems, and many of them have way worse problems than many others. Um, there's no question. There's schools that aren't providing an adequate education, and uh, there's no question that some bullying uh, and all sorts of other bad stuff can happen in schools. And I think that it is often going to be the case, as it is no doubt today, that homeschooling parents will do a better job of educating and of protecting their kids against things like bullying. Um, and they should have the right to do that, to take their kids out of the public schools and to do better by them. And all I'm saying is that there should be some burden on parents to demonstrate that actually there are some problems of that type that mean they wanna withdraw the kids from the public schools and that they are capable of educating the kids themselves. And then I wanna have some check that the kids, yeah, take a course or so at the public school, even if the public school is full of problems. The fact is there's a safety for children in having them observed by more than one set of eyes. There's a safety for them being seen by a whole lot of other, parents, teachers, kids who can sense or see that something's desperately wrong at home. So um, other, I mean, I think that's, that's, I could say more, but I'll let other people respond. Terry, you're next. Right, well, you know, Professor Bartholet says that it's safe to, for these children to go to the public school, that in fact, that's why under her proposed regulatory regime for homeschooling, she would expect um, young people to take uh, some classes or activities at the local public school, the local government school. The issue though, is that government schools are not safe for many children, and here we have a highly regulated, standardized system of schooling uh, that's increasingly focused on surveillance with video cameras and metal detectors, um, where you have licensed educators and you still have rampant abuse. I mean, USA Today uh, just last fall revealed the federal probe into the Chicago public schools that found uh, 280 adult on student sexual harassment complaints and 2,800 student on student sexual harassment complaints over the course of four years. I don't think that we can, we can say that a regulated system of government schooling is protecting children better than their parents could do in uh, a homeschool situation. Certainly, if there is evidence of wrongdoing, then there should absolutely be punishments for the people committing these heinous crimes against children. Milton? Sure, okay. The way I'll address this, let me talk briefly about a, another piece of research that I've done. Um, in 2013, my colleague, Ram Kuzman, and I put together um, a comprehensive review of the homeschooling literature. We have updated that, and a new edition is going to come out in 2020. It's called Homeschooling, a Comprehensive Survey of the Literature. Now, um, what we find in so many variables, over and over and over again, when you look at all the data that's been collected on homeschoolers versus public schoolers, is basically it doesn't matter. There is not a lot of noticeable difference, empirically verifiable difference, between how homeschoolers turn out 
and how public schools turn out on any number of variables. This particular one that we're discussing right now, um, abuse and neglect, it's, it, that's why when I made my comments, I've said, we don't know, there's not any data about like, you know, more public schoolers, more homeschoolers. To me, that is, that is an irrelevant discussion. Um, the, the kind of concerns that are being voiced by the questioner um, come out of a long tradition of people who are critical of public education. Of course, we've had a lot of that. Um, usually, when you look at surveys, people think, in general, homeschooling is terrible. I mean, I'm sorry, uh, public education is terrible all over, everywhere else except for my own school. A lot of parents like their own school, but they think public education as a whole is not any good. Um, so we want to not use our own personal anecdote to try to generalize about the entire thing. If you want to generalize, what you want to say is, really, the outcomes of a kid have a lot more to do with the family background that that kid comes from than with what kind of school they go to. It doesn't really matter whether they're homeschooled, whether they go to public schools, whether they go to private schools. What matters is the wealth, the uh, marital status, um, the, you know, basically the, the level of security and safety that they have in the home. And there you're going to get a wide range in a public school setting, you know, in a private school setting, in a homeschool setting. That's what's more important than uh, these kind of debates about which kind of school is better. Uh, Elizabeth, you had a little bit you wanted to add to this uh, about the research. So if you yes. want to go ahead, maybe a minute or two. Just a minute. Um, so I honor Milton as the supreme expert on the research, but I'm just going to differ a little, Milton, with how you sum up your conclusions, because it sounds like you're saying at least that the outcomes are similar. And I believe, having read also your recent wonderful update on the research and your earlier work, that we don't know enough to know that the outcomes are similar, because we don't have good studies of the overall population of homeschoolers. What we know is that it's the homeschoolers that I believe represent a uh, significantly successful subset of homeschoolers, the ones who do actually go to college, yeah, they do pretty well at college. They do comparably uh, with non-homeschoolers who go to college, but we do not know about the overall population of homeschoolers in a way that I think enables us to say that overall, it doesn't matter um, whether you go or uh, whether you're homeschooled or not. And secondly, I don't think even if we had that overall answer, it would answer my concern because it doesn't answer the concern about subsets. It, it's true, obviously, that there are sensationally successful homeschool children, but there's a subset that I think we have to worry about. And in, in an unregulated state of homeschooling, um, we have no idea and we certainly don't have any research on problematic subsets and how well they're doing as compared to how well they would do if they were at public school. All right. Thank you. Uh, I'm afraid I don't think we totally answered our question about uh, whether or not there's evidence that public schooling is safer or more effective than homeschooling. But uh, certainly I, there's a lot of question about the what data do we have and how useful is the data when we talk about lots of education issues? Maybe we can get back to that because we do, uh, we, we have some time, but we also have a lot of questions. So uh, this question is in particular for Carrie, but I think it uh, uh, kind of goes again to the crux of the issue. And I think it's a good one. Uh, Jill asks, what strategy, uh, uh, Carrie, do you have to protect those students or kids who are maltreated? And I think that this is a, a very important question because, uh, again, I have a, a heavy uh, bias toward innocence until proven guilty, but it's hard not to get sort of very upset when you hear about kids who, even if it's a very small percentage, may be isolated even from neighbors. So people aren't seeing what's happening to the child. That life, it still seems to me, is one that we may need to pro take some basic proactive steps to, to monitor. But I also see that monitoring can be extremely dangerous because government tends to like to then control. But I think it's a great question. So what is the mechanism to protect kids? Right, Jill, this is such a great and important question because it really gets to the heart of this overall discussion is how do we protect children in particular how do we protect the subset of children who are abused and neglected, um, whether they are in a homeschool situation or, as I've mentioned before, in a government school where, again, we can see that abuse is rampant and not always caught. 
I think the key issue here is that we have child abuse laws in every state. And these laws should be enforced, that child protection services might need to be reformed so that it can really focus on identifying and prosecuting um, examples of child abuse and neglect. Uh, I think that the problem is, is that we're conflating child abuse and homeschooling. And what we should be doing instead is looking at improving the existing institution that is, is created to protect children, and that's child protection services, rather than adding a layer of regulation on a single group of people, like singling out a particular group for increased surveillance and suspicion. Um, you know, I think that there is a lot to be said for improving child protection services. I think that they absolutely need to be doing a better job of identifying and prosecuting child abuse, but we should not be singling out a particular group of homeschoolers for this kind of suspicion. Um, and, and this goes true again with the abuse that's happening in government schools where um, we do have mandatory school reporter, mandatory abuse reporters, and this is still happening under their nose. So I'm not convinced that increased regulation uh, is going to save more children, that child protection services simply needs to be improved to do its job. Milton? Okay, it looks like my video is off. Yeah, I don't know, can you still hear me? As long as we can hear you, which we can, you're good to go. Okay, okay. Um, well, so I have a couple of thoughts on this. Here we're venturing out. I see myself more as a historian and a student of policy than as someone who's actually making normative arguments, but I'll, I'll step out of that role a little bit here. Um, the concern I have with the sort of thing that Carrie just said is that, um, and the reason I think homeschooling is coming up for discussion here is it is being used by, by a very small subset, no doubt, but it is being used as a mechanism to avoid the kinds of detection that you were just talking about. Child Protective Services has no way of finding out about these kids if they're completely stuck at home in the basement for four years, never being contacted by anybody else. These, these kids will die in the basement and no one will know. That's my concern. That's why I think some basic minimal um, so, so sorts of things like what Neil suggested at the very beginning, uh, to me, are just commonsensical. And over and over, state after state after state ha has been rebuffing common sense legislation proposals such as someone who's been convicted of child abuse should not be allowed to instantly homeschool. We might want to do a, a check on that. Someone who's a, a registered sex offender might not be the kind of person we want automatically being able to pull their kid out of public school. So those are the sorts of, to me, common sense reforms that 100% of America should be able to get behind including homeschooling advocates, because you homeschoolers do not want that kind of person making homeschooling look bad in newspaper after newspaper after newspaper. Uh, Betsy, and then we'll give Carrie, when you're done, just a brief second to respond to something Milton said. Uh, Elizabeth, sorry. I think Milton said, because it's so obvious, if you, for example, we have examples of parents withdrawing their kids from school when they've been reported for child abuse, okay? They don't like being reported, they don't like being investigated, so they decide to quote, homeschool. So once they're homeschooling, then there's no possibility of them being reported. So the system doesn't have a chance to work. Um, beyond anecdotes, we do have a couple of studies that, are, that I mentioned before that I think are quite telling. So in Connecticut, they looked at all the children withdrawn for homeschooling over a certain period of time. Every school in all, uh, in you know, every child withdrawn in I think six districts in Connecticut for a period of time. 36% of the children removed for homeschooling were removed to parents who had multiple prior reports of abuse and neglect. And we don't want to talk just about convictions. It's very hard to get convictions. Reports of child abuse are the best predictor of future child abuse. So 36% of the kids removed for homeschooling, it, you know, went to families that were a clear risk to those parents, to those kids, sorry. And into a situation where nobody was going to be able to see and thus report abuse. A second study I want to mention, done by child abuse pediatricians who have often expressed concern about the danger of homeschooling to the kids they see. They did a study of a sample of cases of horrific torture. Um, it was a small sample, but nonetheless, 76% of the kids 
in this horrific torture situation um, were homeschooled. 76% of the school age kids suffering horrific torture incidents were homeschooled kids. Obviously they're kept at home by the parents knowing that there won't be witnesses and they can get away with whatever they want. Carrie, did you want to add something? Right. So a very large percentage of the very small cases cited in Professor Bartholet's law review piece of homeschooled students who were abused by their parents were already known to Child Protective Services. Um, so again, to me, this indicates a problem with Child Protective Services and improving the system that we've already established to protect children. Uh, you know, to Milton's point about forbidding homeschoolers who've been convicted of child abuse from homeschooling, to me, again, that sounds like an issue for the courts to decide in terms of their arrangement with um, the families and in terms of deciding what are the parental rights in cases of convicted child abuse. Um, I will also say to Professor Bartholet's point about parents pulling their children from school if they've received a CPS complaint, there was a fascinating large scale investigative report done by HuffPost and the Heckinger Report back in 2018 that found that school districts were weaponizing CPS against non-compliant parents, obstinate parents, parents who didn't like the recommendations of the school, whether it was a label they giving the child or medication recommendations, or some other dispute between the school officials and the parents. And this report found that CPS was being weaponized by these uh, school districts and tragically were being focused mostly on low income in minority families who, it was heartbreaking in the article, saying that they expect CPS to be visiting their neighborhoods frequently. Um, so, you know, I think this is a much deeper issue that goes well beyond homeschooling and truly is about uh, how our current system meant to protect children is or is not working. Terrific. Okay. Uh, the next question um, is one that I think is kind of interesting. Uh, it sort of moves us a little bit away from the present day uh, into history, but I think it's sort of important and it may be kind of telling for the present day. So uh, we got a question from somebody who didn't want to be a name, so they're just anonymous. But they said, our founding father's education in some cases was much less than the formal education um, given today. Why strangle the diversity that homeschooling offers to the next generation of our country? Shall we not continue in so great a cause to raise thinkers, not droids? Uh, and what I think in particular is interesting about this is, uh, many of you may not know it, but Horace Mann, this uh, so-called father of the common school, he homeschooled his kids. I believe John Adams homeschooled his kids. Many founders were themselves homeschooled. One of the arguments uh, that's presented against homeschooling is we're not preparing citizens for our democracy, but certainly a lot of people who had a lot to do with framing our democracy were themselves not either the products or sometimes the consumers of public schooling. So this is for Milton first as our historian, how common was homeschooling? And uh, for everybody, is there research that shows that uh, public schooling produces better citizens or is, that actually shows public schooling is necessary for democracy. And the flip side of that is there's is there research that shows homeschoolers are bad citizens and that homeschooling is clearly and empirically antithetical to democracy. Uh, and again, we'll have Milton go first since he is our historian. I hope Milton is there. Uh, we, we don't have sound from Milton. Well, uh, let's see. I will go next, and then hopefully Milton will uh, be back on shortly. Uh, let's see. Uh, Elizabeth, do you want to talk about that a little? And then we'll go to Carrie, then we'll go back to Milton. Well, definitely homeschooling has very interesting origins, and this um, definitely a major a major strain in the early years was John Holt and progressive views about education. Um, I absorbed John Holt's books when I was raising my first child and found them very interesting and 
persuasive and it led me in the direction not of homeschooling, but of seeking out schools that provided uh, a lot of room for creativity, creative learning. Um, I, I don't think the research um, says anything one way or the other about uh, whether public schools or homeschooling produces, you know, better citizens. Again, it doesn't, for the most part, the research on homeschoolers looks at the successful subset of homeschoolers that we can study because they're the ones that are visible, that take tests, that go to college. And again, they do okay. I think there's some indicators in that research that maybe they're not as uh, great looking on some indicators of civic values, but I don't think that shows much. The real thing is we don't have research on the subset that I'm concerned about, which is the ones that aren't being exposed to outside ideas um, that are being kept in these very isolated home schooling families. Obviously, lots of homeschooling families are doing all sorts of both interesting progressive education, but also interesting things to um, expose their children to ideas about what's going on in the world and how they might participate in positive good ways. Part of the problem uh, with the absence of meaningful research is we don't have any basic regulation of homeschooling, so we can't know the homeschooling population, so we can't study the overall population. We study these very successful subsets that surface and whose parents want them to surface um, and take standardized tests like the SAT and go to college. And, you know, they do okay in college. I think those, the studies there are somewhat mixed in terms of pros and cons of how they do in college, but that's minor compared to the fact that we don't know about that subset that is growing up in isolation. Uh, Carrie, before I go to you, I just want to say, so we're at 102, but uh, I already asked the panelists if they'd be willing to go to 130 uh, or about 130 if we have a lot of questions and comments. We still do. So we're going to take this all the way to 130. Um, uh, so just stay with us. And uh, if you have a burning question you want to tweet out, use hashtag Cato CEF, or you can submit questions still with the other platforms. Over to you now, Carrie. Right. So the historian Carl Castle wrote that society educates in many ways, the state educates through schools. And I think homeschoolers show that to be true, is that homeschoolers disentangle education from schooling and really, for the most part, become immersed in the people, places and things of their community. I don't think Professor Bartholet has compelling data to show that a majority or many homeschoolers are isolating their children. Uh, certainly not in 2020 with today's homeschoolers that are much more demographically, geographically, ideologically, and socioeconomically diverse than they were even a decade or two ago. Um, so homeschoolers are already showing this to be true. I did cite in my prepared remarks Professor Daniel Hamlin's research on cultural capital, finding that homeschooled students are regularly immersed in their communities and are two to three times more likely to be going to libraries, museums, and cultural events than government school children. So there's no evidence there that homeschoolers are not getting this larger, um, more enriching education. There's another study by Albert Chang at the University of Ar Arkansas who found that homeschoolers are actually more politically tolerant of different political views than uh, private or public school students. All right, I believe Milton is back. Milton, this question was actually for you, but as often happens in the world of all panels being electronic, uh, we ran into a few technical difficulties. So maybe you didn't hear the question, but the question came from uh, someone anonymous, but they said our founding father's education in some cases was much less than the formal education given today. Why strangle the diversity that homeschooling offers the next generation of the country? And I won't read the whole thing again because we're trying to go uh, quickly. But uh, I thought what was interesting was, is there historical evidence or other evidence you see that um, that our democracy or the creation of citizens is either uh, 
proven to be more effective when you have public schools or is it proven that it's less effective if you have homeschooling and in particular if you have insights into what members of the founding generation how they actually were educated or educated their own kids that would be great as our resident historian sure yeah so one of the major themes of the book that you held up for everyone earlier is that um homeschooling as we think of it today is very different from what those people that you were mentioning founding various founding fathers and stuff like were doing in the past. But the modern homeschooling movement was born out of a reaction against compulsory public education. That didn't exist in the you know, mid-1700s. Um, it came later. And so the, when the early Americans were teaching their children at home, they were typically doing that because there weren't any other options. Um, and gradually, as population increased, um, the options proliferated and people were willing and delighted, actually, to send their children to institutions rather than that to teach them in their own houses. Um, that, that was something that emerged organically, gradually. It really wasn't an issue. It didn't become an issue until a much, much later in American history. So yes, lots of the founding fathers and many people thereafter taught their kids at home. The fireside education, you mentioned Horace Mann. Uh, he did the very same thing. Um, so yeah, that very common, uh, less common as you get more and more towards the 20th century. By the early 20th century, hardly anyone's doing it. Um, and then it continues that way until about the mid 1970s. And then a very few first people on the left start doing it, kind of radical hippie type folks. And then by the 1980s, a lot of conservative Christians are joining them. So that's, that's the basic trajectory. Now, in terms of the evidence about whether or not homeschooling makes you better at, at being at specific minded or worse, um, what I said earlier applies. Um, Elizabeth's critique is a valid one that on the whole, most of the evidence that we have, the literature on homeschooling does not is not population wide. However, there are a couple of databases that do offer, um, if not population, it does offer random sampling. And um, we have the Cardis Education Survey and we have the National Survey of Youth and Religion. And in both of these, and there have been some very sophisticated statistical analyses of these things, you don't see a whole lot of difference between what homeschoolers look like and what people who went to public school, even if you control for parent economic backgrounds, you don't see a whole lot of difference in terms of their political orientation. Uh, the Cardis did find some slight differences, and they actually didn't. And this Cardis was an organization that is very favorable to private education. And despite what they wanted to find, they actually did find in their own surveys that um, the homeschoolers didn't look quite as good as public schoolers in terms of civic participation um, and some of a few other adult outcomes. Um, higher education, fewer of them went to more prestigious schools, and more of them went to open access, like community type colleges and things like that. But anyway, that's the basic gist of it. The real point is. I, uh, I, can I just say this over and over? Homeschooling as such is not going to make you more or less civic minded. Public schooling as such, it's, it's really all about what the parents are doing in their homes. Homeschooling, if anything, exaggerates or increases the influence of the parent, obviously. All right, so on to another question. Um, I had mentioned the possibility that one way that more one potential compromise um, for trying to make sure that there are no kids that fall through the cracks uh, of receiving the education that they should, is that potentially uh, all homeschoolers should give some test of basic reading, writing, um, and mathematics to their students or their children. Uh, and somebody, uh, actually several people, but Juanita in particular, uh, wanted to know, well, aren't there problems with standardized tests? Aren't they very limiting? And I think that there's certainly a lot of evidence that standardized tests are problematic. Standardized tests, as Juanita observes, are also are often connected to state standards. And so if we hold homeschoolers accountable to state tests, they would be essentially forced to use the state curriculum. And that's very problematic. So I would ask you all, uh, is there maybe some way to have a test uh, that does not require people to be on a, to de facto be on a state standard uh, that could still sort of just get an assessment of are these kids learning some basics that they need uh, and we'll go to Carrie I think first on that and then we'll go to Milton and Elizabeth. Well, I think the real question here is whose standard, you know, is it the standard of the government schools where two thirds of US students are not proficient in reading? Is that the standard? Um, you know, and then homeschooling in particular brings up, uh, you know, a lot of different reasons. The number one reason, according to US federal data, why parent schooling is concern about 
the environment of other schools. And the second is concern about academic instruction. So in many cases, parents are not liking what they're seeing in government schools and want something different. Um, so I would worry about imposing standards, government schooling standards, on a very heterogeneous group of families who are choosing homeschooling for a wide variety of reasons, often because they don't like standardized testing. In fact, much of the recent growth over the past decade in the homeschooling population is coming from urban secular parents who are disillusioned by the focus on standardized testing in government schools. And they want something that is uh, much more flexible for their ch children. In particular, you're seeing um, reading expectations being pushed down to younger and younger children, going all the way now to kindergarten, where you're expecting young children to be able to read and then evaluating them or labeling them if they're not able to read. And homeschoolers will say there's a wide range of uh, ages in which children will read. Some of the research I cite in my unschooled book finds that the average age for reading proficiency in a homeschool population is about eight years old, which would be potentially higher than what we would find in government schools today as these reading expectations get pushed to lower grades. So I think we have to be very careful. And now finally, uh, and oh, two more things. One would be um, a, an increasing number of parents are choosing homeschooling because they are parents of children with special needs and their children's needs are not being met in government schools and they want something that's much more individualized. So I would very much worry about how standardized testing would impact that population of homeschooled children. Finally, I would just say in terms of who's standard, if we go back to uh, the initiation of compulsory schooling laws in the 19th century, you know, the expectation for literacy, for example, would be that those Catholics would have had to be reading the Protestant Bible. So whose standard are we talking about? Milton. Yeah, um, I agree with pretty much everything Carrie just said. Um, again, I try not to be too normative. Uh, if I were going to talk about this issue, what I would want to see is um, if, if the parent has a basic minimum educational competence, uh, like Carrie suggested, I would want to maximize the freedom of that parent to do what that parent decides. Um, that's why, to me, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense that a few states have rolled back some of the requirements. Um, there used to be a requirement in some states that um, parents had to have a high school diploma or a GED. To me, it doesn't make any sense how a, that a parent could teach at the high school level if that parent has not herself graduated from high school. Um, so I would I would look at it like that. I would not want to create a, a test that would you know, impose a curriculum or, or require certain levels of achievement by a certain age for the very reasons Carrie said. A lot of homeschoolers do um, interesting creative pedagogies that might not lead to the kind of uh, success that you think of as success in a public school context. And I want to give them the freedom to do that. Um, but it would make sense to me to have parents with minimal educational competence. And perhaps maybe a, a one-time test, age 13 or something, to make sure a kid can read. I, I don't know. But I, I'm, I'm less concerned with that as a, than I am with the more the physical abuse sorts of issues. All right, Elizabeth. So I disagree with both of the prior speakers. Um, I think I don't want to back off and, and talk about whether parents should be in total control of their children. So to me, it makes sense to have a balance, to have parents have lots and lots of control over their children, but to have the state have some say in protecting children and in trying to raise them so that the children have a decent chance at a future and um, also um, are likely to participate in some positive, meaningful ways in the larger society. So that's my starting point. And I think going on from that, that it makes sense for the state to be able to say, we think our children are going to be better off if by the time they're 18, they've got some basic reading and writing skills and some math skills and some knowledge of science. And we're going to regulate homeschooling in a way that means that kids are gonna be tested on an annual basis to see if they've made minimum learning progress in those areas. 
I consider the tests a more meaningful protection for kids than requiring credentials for parents because you can require credentials or from parents, but they still may not be committed to teaching their kids anything. So I think annual tests and standardized, and I know there are all sorts of problems with state education, state standardized tests. The question is, do you want 100% control parents, or do you think kids are going to be better off, all things considered, having both the state and the parent play some role in uh, protecting children's rights and future options? Well, that leads nicely to a question from Aaron. Uh, this was a question I was going to ask some permutation of, or at least something I was thinking about. If nobody else asked it, but we've gotten the, her question and others that are related. Uh, she says, basically, um, would you, uh, in particular, this is for Professor Bartlett, but uh, this is, I think, applicable to everybody when we talk about exposure to diverse ideas. Um, and that, that one reason we would want to have homeschoolers have uh, potentially uh, required to take a course in a public school or something is to be exposed to diversity. Well, what about the flip side of that? Should people who go to public schools be required to spend a certain amount of time in uh, maybe a religious school or, or spending time at a young Republicans meeting or something like that? Uh, if we truly wanted to expose people to diverse ideas, shouldn't that also occur by going to something other than sort of the default school that people go to, which is the public school? There's a lot more you can talk about diversity, but I thought that was a very interesting way to turn this uh, and talk about kind of the flip side of it. So why don't we start with Milton, uh, and then we'll go to Elizabeth, then we'll go to Carrie. A view on this? I, think Mil uh, I, I appreciate oh, the Okay, what I just said was, I don't really have a view on this. I appreciate the idea of wanting to expose as many people as possible to as much ideological diversity as possible. I don't know how you would regulate that uh, or make it happen. Um, to me, that's more of a thing you do on your own. Um, for example, I'm about to start, uh, I teach at a fairly conservative religious school, and I'm going to be partnering with a colleague who's also a historian at a much more liberal school, and we're going to be exchanging, our students are going to be exchanging back and forth uh, during this election cycle coming up. That's going to be a wonderful educational experience. And we're doing that on our own. I, I love that idea, but I don't know how you could mandate that or create some sort of, you know, oversight board that would require that to happen across the country. That doesn't make any sense to me. Elizabeth? Well, I think the public school should definitely make an effort to teach in the school context respect for diversity of religion, of views, of political perspectives, that that ought to be part of civics education and respect for other people and, you know, uh, non discriminatory attitudes toward other people with other views. Um, I I think that the it doesn't necessarily to me make sense to say and then they should those kids should be required to go to a religious school. I think in terms of the kind of diversity that Aaron is after, the fact is these kids are going home. They're spending most of their waking hours with parents. Uh, those parents can expose them to them will, obviously, to their own views and values, to their friends' views and values, to their community, to their religions. Um, I don't think that by having to be in the public school, children are going to be missing out on at least some exposure to other views, namely those of the parents. Whereas if you keep them only in the home, they are missing out on alternative views. Uh, I'm just going to, we're going to go to Carrie in a second, but I want to ask a follow-up to that. If the public schools, uh, by law, must be non-religious, that they cannot uh, teach religious precepts is true, um, how do the students who go to a public school then get truly exposed to a school or learning environment where religion is central? So it seems to me that you can easily put students into a school where religion is sort of sidelined as this is not something we can talk about. How do the kids who go to that school get exposed to where religion is central? Is that for me? That's for Elizabeth. Oh yeah, sorry, for you real fast. Then we gotta home. go to Carrie. I would say home. You know, those, the parents have those views. They are 
free uh, to raise the children in those views and values, to take them to special religious classes, to take them to church and the like. So I don't see that there's a problem. I don't see that, I don't think it would be appropriate for the schools to be teaching religion in that sense. I think that's where my fear of orthodoxy would come in. I don't think the school should be teaching any orthodoxy. Carrie? Oh, sorry, uh, Carrie? Right. Well, I mean, I agree with Milton that we can't mandate this and we can't um, require uh, exposure to all kinds of different ideologies and viewpoints. Um, I think it's peculiar that in her law review article, Professor Bartholet singles out homeschoolers to be the ones that must take these classes or have this exposure to the public schools but doesn't uh, single out private schools for doing the same thing. And she does at the end talk a little bit about um, future potential policy implications for private education, but is, uh, doesn't go into it in detail. It seems to me this would be um, a, an important issue because as Milton said earlier, private education in many states is as unregulated as homeschool and homeschooling really is just another form of private education. Terrific. Okay, I'm going to get to another one. Uh, again, it gets to one of the central issues we've been talking about. Uh, this is from Jenny. I'm going to paraphrase what she said. Uh, but basically, uh, is there an argument if you're going to say that homeschoolers should have kind of drop-ins from uh, state authorities to check on child welfare? Should that apply to everyone? For instance, before a child is school-aged, uh, they're at home. Should we be having CPS people uh, drop it on those houses just to make sure that the kids are okay. What about um, during the summer when kids are not in school? Uh, or is there something specifically about homeschooling uh, that means we should put or we should have a proactive government stance to inspect and make sure that things are okay for the kids? Uh, and we'll start with, why don't we go with Carrie, then Elizabeth, then Milton. Right, this um, discussion about regular home visits by government authorities into the private homes of homeschoolers with no uh, probable cause of wrongdoing has probably led to the most criticism I've heard in recent days uh, over this law review article. And in fact, just last week I received an email from a Hispanic homeschooling mother in Connecticut who was very, very concerned specifically about these home visits. And I'll just state what she wrote. That they want to have surveillance into our homes by having government officials visit and have parents show proof of their qualified experience to be a parent to their own child is yet another way for local and federal government to do what they have done to Native Americans, Blacks, the Japanese, Hispanics, etc. in the past. Her proposal would once again interfere and hinder a certain population from progressing forward. Great. Uh, let's see. Elizabeth, you're next. So I definitely have fears for many kids in the zero to five age range um, that in the most isolated families, they may not be seeing doctors um, or anyone outside of the family. So is that a problem? Is that a risk? Yes. Um, do other societies treat these types of issues very differently? Absolutely. So in our peer countries in Europe, universal home visitation, early home visitation is thought of as a norm. Um, in our country, David Olds has a wonderful model of early home visitation that involves, it's completely voluntary, but involves visiting uh, first time parents in the hospital, advising them about how doing drugs and alcohol and tobacco are dangerous for the, for the pregnancy and the birth and the, and the future child. Um, and in his program, they visit uh, parents during the first couple of years. Again, it's entirely voluntary. It is very successful. There's tremendously good social science research on the nurse's 
Prevention Program, which is David Old's program. And yes, it helps reduce abuse and neglect and uh, future problems for children. So do I think there should be more such problem programs? Absolutely. Um, nobody's, you know, they don't exist now. Would it be better? Yes. And is it a great, you know, are kids at risk for abuse and neglect in scary ways, zero to five, that they're not once they go to school? Absolutely. Going to school, kids who do get to go to school, is a huge protection for them against abuse and neglect. Great. Milton? Yeah, I'll say two small things. Uh, number one, just a general overarching principle, I think part of what's at stake here, what's going on here is, you know, the history of homeschooling is about the history of the adversarial relationship between one group of people and the government. And that, that, that history has an interesting cause and then we can talk about that, but I don't have time to do that. But so point one, I would love to see us get beyond that and stop seeing it as homeschoolers versus the government and we're recognizing that we are the government in this country. And so, uh, you know, we, it would be great if we could have some sort of uh, coherent joint effort on this regard. Uh, second little minor point I'll make. Uh, if you wanted to come up with some kind of policy short of having unannounced visits by government officials and, uh, knocking on the door, um, one possibility that it's not my idea, other people have had this idea, is what about something like allowing um, anybody who's a mandated reporter, let's say every homeschooling parent has to get two eyeballs, two sets of eyeballs, maybe your family physician, somebody who teaches your Sunday school class, um, something like that, somebody who is a mandatory reporter um, two people sign a little sheet of paper saying, I've seen this kid, this kid is good. And then that's submitted as part of your homeschooling paperwork. Something like that would be a much less invasive way of doing this than having forced visits several times a year or something like that. Terrific. Thanks, Milton. Actually, that segues to, I think, what will be our last question because we're now almost at the end of overtime. Um, there's a question here from Amy, and I'm going to ask the question. I'm going to expand on a little bit. Uh, Amy asked this for all speakers. If the state has not proven they can excel at educating the majority of children, why should parents be required to give them any amount of control or oversight? And I think in particular what this question lends itself to is, so what is, if you could, you know, this may not be your final policy proposal, but what do you think is the right balance between uh, the role of the, you know, between the role of parents and the role of the state what do you think that is? Uh, I'll have Milton go first because your proposal that you just talked about, I know it's not yours entirely, but the one you just talked about seems like it may be your answer. If it is, you can just say, that's my answer. Uh, and then we'll go to Carrie and we'll let Elizabeth finish. I'll make one small point. Um, that I, I, I'm not sure I would grant the premise of that question. Um, there's a great book by Christopher Lubienski called The Public School Advantage that talks about how empirically, if you actually look at the actual data, public schools actually are doing pretty well. They actually do better than private schools on many markers when you control for SES. Um, it has a lot more to do with uh, where you're, if you're going to public school in an inner city school uh, with very limited resources and uh, you know, a demographic that is, you know, the stack stakes are stacked against you, then yeah, it's not going to look so good. But most public schools are actually doing a very good job and most uh, parents are happy to keep sending their kids and that's why they're still doing what they're doing. So that's one thing I just thought I'd throw in. Uh, I'll just throw in that the Lubienzi study is uh, debatable, but as is all research. Uh, anyway, so next we'll go to Carrie. Right. Well, I would say that Amy's right, that government schools are failing many children and in many cases are not meeting their own standards for uh, achievement. Uh, so I think it's a really good point. In terms of policy going forward, my recommendation is to keep this uh, at the legislative level, at the state level, um, where you have elected officials accountable to the public in terms of determining what is the appropriate level of regulation, instead of moving toward federal courts deciding uh, what is appropriate for homeschoolers, which is sort of one of the final recommendations that Professor Bartholet's Law Review article makes. This is a local issue, should be decided uh, at the state level, 50 states coming up with their own plans um, of how they regulate private education more broadly. Great, and Elizabeth, you get the last word on this question and the last one before I wrap things up. Thank you. Um, so I would agree with Milton that I think the public schools 
state schools do a pretty good job. Definitely could be improved, definitely have lots of problems, particularly for, for poor kids. Um, I would also say parents haven't and couldn't quote prove that they're doing a great job all the time. Indeed, we know that some parents don't and that some parents can't be trusted not to abuse and neglect their children, not to exploit them in various ways. Um, so moving on from that, what's the right balance? I would say it's a balance. So what homeschooling advocates are demanding, what the HSLDA is demanding, it's not a balance at all. It's complete parent power. That's why I labeled my article Parent Rights Absolutism. They want no regulation whatsoever, stay completely out of it. Parents have total right to total control over their children. I think there needs to be a balance. I think neither parents nor state are going to be perfect, and kids are going to be way better off if both parent and state are involved. There is some balance. The state has, and it's not balance of parent and state exactly, it's a, it's a balance with the state having the right to assert the rights of the child to both education and protection. Well, this has been, I think, a very interesting panel. I think it's been an excellent uh, exchange of ideas, an excellent discussion. I am very sorry that we couldn't get to many of the questions and comments that we received. There's been, uh, uh, I'll just say, a very high level of interest in this event. That means lots of questions and comments came in. And again, I apologize. I couldn't get to them all. Uh, many people asked very good ones that other people asked. So I hope we got to many of the topics you wanted to cover. I want to thank our panelists in particular for participating. It's great that they could all get together and we could have a, a good discussion about this very important topic. I think that everybody here uh, ultimately wants to get at what's best for kids and best uh, for society overall, even though we clearly disagree on many of the particulars of how that's done. And I also want to let everybody know who's watching, and we actually got some questions and comments about this. This event will be archived. I think depending on the platform you're watching on, some may automatically record it. Uh, and I believe that Cato on our web page for this event uh, will have uh, a very nice uh, archived version. I think you can watch sort of like the raw event right away. We'll have a great archive version, probably 24 hours or so. But there are many places that this was streaming. And I'm sure if you missed it or your friends missed it or your colleagues missed it or anybody you ever meet missed it, they can certainly watch on the archive. Uh, again, I'm Neil McCluskey. I'm the director of the Center for Educational Freedom at the Cato Institute. And thank you for joining us.